I walked in there and the energy, I felt like I was discovering like an underground society. I'm like, you guys have been here the whole time? <laughs> Hello Saints, my name is Jeff. I am a pastor in Utah, exploring everything I can about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and I'm here with my amazing wife, Joy. Hello. And with my good Latter-day Saint friend, Kurt Frankham. Hello. And we are here at Centerpoint Church in Orm, Utah, which is a Protestant church, which is something that Kurt probably doesn't experience too often until recently, because we <laughs> took him to Protestant church for the very first time. Three times. Three churches, one day. We're gonna get all of his reactions in just a second, but here's kind of how the day unfolded. What do you think Kurt's gonna think of church? Kind of um, diving in this morning in the three different services at once. So it might be a little bit overwhelming, but I think there's gonna be things that he likes about it. And I am curious to hear what he prefers about his church too. All right, we're here. Time to take Kurt to church. Okay, so here's how we're gonna do this. All right. We're gonna go to three churches today. So I hope you're ready to go. I'm used to three hour church, Jeff. <laughs> but not three different churches. Three churches. And the reason why we're doing this is because, as you know, there's a lot of diversity in yes. the Protestant world. So I wanna take you to a more traditional church first. Then I'm gonna take you to a smaller church plant that meets in a school, second. Love it. And then we're gonna be going to a larger, more established church, third. Let's do this. Let's do it. Okay, one church down. One church down, we did it. How do you feel? I had a great nap. No, I'm kidding, <laughs> I'm kidding. No, it's great. It, it was, uh, had, had similar vibes as uh, the, the Catholic masses I've been to, right? Uh -huh. Ready to head to the next one? Let's do it. Let's go. Okay, so now we're at a school building. It's not a church building. Okay. All right. Because this is a church plant. Are you familiar with what a church plant is? Uh, I mean, that's a. they're just starting the church, yeah, right? They, so that's why we're meeting in a school building, and it's going to feel a lot different than the last church we were at. Gotcha. All right. Ready? Let's do it. Definitely different. You know, you walk in there, it's sort of like you're entering almost like a party, like you know, something's yeah. going on. There's a different energy here. It's not so that pious, like. Yeah. This next church we're going to is one that was originally a church plant, but has grown significantly. Just not too long ago, there was only like 300. Now there's over 2,000. Wow. So what were you expecting when we got up at the early morning hours and we drove down to pick you up before we took you to church? In those moments as you were kind of getting ready, kind of what were you anticipating the day to look like? Yeah, you know, I'd been to, I had been to a few Catholic masses, funerals and things I've attended, and I knew it wouldn't be maybe that. Kind of traditional. Yeah, more traditional, right? Yeah. <clears throat> but So I knew it would be uh, different, but... Uh, I really didn't know, especially maybe I thought more of the contemporary thing. Like, you know, I've seen different worship songs on on YouTube or whatnot that, 
yeah, maybe that's, uh, you know, the big stage, the band and things like that. Yeah. Um, and it, there was quite a difference. Yeah. And in our kind of vernacular, a lot of times when you're talking about like a Catholic or Lutheran or Episcopalian church, the word that uses liturgical, yeah. there's a little bit more liturgy. There's more of a format to how the service flows. And a lot of that liturgy is oftentimes tied to like very historic traditions that can go back hundreds of years, yeah. which is much different than a more contemporary American evangelical church where it's more free flowing and you do have the band and you've just got a lot more of a casual approach. It's still a liturgy. It's still an order of service, but it's not nearly as rooted in tradition. Yeah. So we wanted to make sure that you got a little bit of a taste of all of that. And the first church that we went to was Good Shepherd Lutheran in Sandy, Utah. What were some of your impressions as we sort of pulled up and walked in? Yeah, so this caught me off guard because I wasn't expecting the Catholic Mass type of thing. Like if I would have driven by as a naive Latter-day Saint in Salt Lake City and saw, because the pastor was standing out front, his mm -hmm. name was Pastor Jeff, actually. Yeah, it's a good name. <laughs> and uh, he was out there in, in some type of robe, you know. So I w almost would have thought, oh, there, that must be a Catholic church. Mm -hmm. You know, he almost looked like, to me, I wouldn't interpret him as a Catholic priest, but uh, no, he was a pastor. What were your impressions of the building? Uh, it definitely had a similar feel to one of our buildings. You know, I would guess it would be built in the 80s maybe. Mm -hmm. And that particular church building is a similar size to a lot of Latter-day Saint meeting houses. Yeah. And it was an early meeting, 8 o'clock, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. And driving up there, I said, Jeff, are we going to see anybody under or under 60 here? And say, yeah, probably not. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, the early services typically are going to draw an older crowd. And especially at a Lutheran church was a more traditional denomination. Um, they actually have different versions of their services. So that early service is a traditional service that uses more hymns, probably gonna have a little bit more of a tighter um, liturgical feel. Yeah. And that was one of the reasons why we went to that early service. So you got that sort of traditional feel. This is a new concept or dynamic for me because all throughout my life, we can never choose the time of the church we go to because it's all organized that, you know, this ward goes at this time. And so even this idea of having different services you can pick from and knowing that the early service most likely would be older people. Mm -hmm. Right. You no, know, that's, that's a dynamic we're unfamiliar with. So. Yeah. And that, that church in particular, is not even a larger church, but because they offer a little bit more of a diverse worship experience, they can just choose to meet however many times they want. I mean, if they wanted to meet on Saturday night, they could. In fact, there's some evangelical churches that do have a service on Saturday nights. Yeah. So it's very different to have those choices and that sort of autonomy to choose them. From what I understand, Latter-day Saints, it's, you know, based on where you live, you yeah. go to this ward at this time. Right. So tell us about some of your impressions about the worship, yeah. specifically at the Lutheran Church. Yeah. You know, one thing that stood out to me, Pastor Jeff was definitely like, he was running the show, right? Where my time as a bishop, you know, in, in theory, I'm running the show. I'm presiding in that meeting but I'm not speaking. I'm basically standing up if it's my turn or one of my counselors to give the announcements, welcome everybody. And then you sort of announce the program and sit down where he's talking about donations that they're making. He's talking about now we're gonna to move to this part. Everybody read this part. You know, he's like, he's a, a, pin, a, a focal point of the service, which which I, I like. I wish uh, even, you know, more bishops maybe do that. I'd love to hear from my bishop more often, right? Or yeah. I think a lot of wards would like to hear uh, the thoughts that they're going through. But obviously, this is his full-time focus. Right. So he has a lot more time to prepare. Yeah. And in smaller churches in particular, which I think this one would qualify, the pastor is usually going to be a prominent, almost MC of yep. the church service. Whenever you get into a larger church setting where they've got gigantic staff, sometimes it's the opposite. Like the only time you see the pastor mm. is when he comes out to preach and then he's gone. And you have <clears throat> other staff members or pastors that are sort of Introducing yeah. people, leading worship, doing the announcements. And that was the case for the mega church we went to. That's right. Sure. Yeah. So tell me about the music. How, how did you experience the music in the Lutheran church? You could have told me those hymns were, or came right out of our hymn book. And mm -hmm. I'd be like, oh, really? I've never heard them. But it sounded that way. Like things that, you know, uh, Mac Wilbur from the Tabernacle Choir could do a r arrangement of those. And they sound like, you know, Tabernacle Choir music. You so know the yeah, very, very similar to our, our hymn. So I was like... I was jiving. I was yeah. in, in, my, in there with, with my people. So there were a couple points in that service in particular where we were reading things in unison or reciting things. We even recited the Apostles' Creed. I think we recited the Lord's Prayer. Was that similar or different than what you've experienced? Yeah, so, and this came throughout different services, but definitely here where I almost have these, these moments of, of almost glimpses of like, I kind of feel like I'm in 
the temple right now because mm-hmm. we'll have these moments of maybe stating something or whatever it is and um and so i i you know i joined in and said the things and they're very we're, we're, i don't know if you refer to them as creeds or what but yeah there were uh, creeds and prayers but they were all biblical yeah biblical yeah just reading verses together and a part of me really appreciated that that you know when i go to sacrament meeting i sort of plant my family down we make sure the kids are busy or paying attention if they're older and then you know other than singing hymns that's there's much participation so i appreciate it especially the and this is something that's similar to our temple as well just the standing and sitting standing and sitting where it kind of keeps you engaged keeps the blood flowing yeah. and rather than just sort of this sort of this beta uh you know state where you're just right. you're just having a passive experience yeah so in that service format that um antiphonal type of worship where there's even a speaker saying something and the audience responding um and reciting things in unison is something you'll get a lot in liturgical services and you're saying it's not really common in a latter-day saint context even within protestant denominations you know a lot of times we'll talk about the phrase holy envy you know things Mm -hmm. that other expressions do that we don't do that we think are kind of cool the one thing i really like about a traditional service like that is they do oftentimes read scripture in unison together yeah and that was something that we did a couple times yeah. as well yeah it's so simple but it really is unifying in, in yeah. the word and i can see you know i've i've seen that maybe more in a sunday school uh, setting in our church where i think it is like just getting everybody engaged and and leading in and just speaking scripture it it's such a i mean it, it centers you it grounds you yeah. you know to the experience yeah were you familiar with the lord's prayer oh uh, yeah i mean I, is that something that is we don't Spoken we don't often? we don't speak it often, uh, other than maybe reading the the scripture when it comes up. Yeah. You know, okay. But uh, in that setting, as we're doing it in a prayer form, uh, probably never. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the other thing, you know, just I appreciate, and I know this happens in other Protestant, you know, uh, but mo- more so in this Lutheran experience of just the moment of the pastor saying, "We're, we're going to pray now for these these donations we've prepared for." You know, I think they're saying in Africa or something. Uh-huh. Uh, or we're going to pray here. Like, just taking a moment and just all of a sudden praying. Where in our faith tradition, it's like opening prayer, right. you know, invocation, benediction, sacrament prayers in there. But for someone to stop in the minute of a message and say, let's pray. Like, yeah. that's that's out, out of the normal for us, which I just appreciate. Like, oh, the, here's the, the pastor just leading his people in prayer. Like, that's that's really great. So at the end, yeah. when people came up and said, oh, thank you for coming, it was so good to see you, you're welcome here, you know. A very common way for us as evangelicals to do that is to be like, hey, there's coffee and donuts back yeah. here. Come get the coffee. I know, Come right? Well, I just appreciate the refreshments in general. Where sure. We do refreshments and we'll bless the refreshments at like a youth activity during the week. Okay. But if someone that said after Saturday. sacrament meeting, hey, we got refreshments in the back, we'd be like, what? Like, <laughs> what's going thing. on here, right? Let alone coffee, right? Yeah. I mean, you might as well have coffee in the back. Um, and yeah, but it's cool. It, it, it makes sense where we're, you know, hurrying off to the next Sunday school or elder school or whatever. Um, they're just taking a moment like, now I can greet my neighbor. Mm-hmm. Where we're trying to do that before the meeting often. Yeah. You know, there's sort of that space to do it after because you're done at that point. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. And people having donuts and coffee and I had neither. But. <laughs> <laughs> so after the service, before we headed out, we had a conversation with the pastor. Yeah. What was that conversation like? Uh, great. I mean, so welcoming. Just um, and this is this is a theme that I noticed throughout that every Latter Day Saint has a, had a negative interaction with an evangelical or Protestant, right? And so we're almost like walking into some of these settings with our guard Garden. up. Like yeah. the minute they sniff out that I'm a Latter Day Saint, like they're gonna like corner me or they're gonna bring something up. And um, you even introduced me a few times as you know Latter Day Saint friend or whatever. And not once did I I didn't feel any of that. Uh, n- nor in the service they weren't like. Protect, you know, protecting their flock from the, the Latter-day Saint people out there. Yeah. So I just appreciate it. Just so welcoming, connected, and it was great. So from there, we jumped in the car, we drove across the valley, and we went to South Jordan to what I was explaining. I don't know if you had heard of the term before, a church plant. Yeah. yeah You're I've familiar with that? Mm-hmm. So it's actually really good friends of ours. Chris and Hannah Bechtel, they planted Seago Church in South Jordan. They're literally meeting in a school, like in the, the main services in a gymnasium. Is it elementary school, is it? Yeah, it's a charter elementary school. Yeah. And so, yeah, when we pulled up to that church, it was much different because it wasn't a church building, you know, church and steeple, but it was a school. Yeah, so this one, it felt like a very modern, more of a modern 
feel walking in there. But it, I was just really impressed how great of a job they did of making it still feel like it didn't feel like a school per se. Um, you know, they had great branding and banners and things and, and signs to lead certain ways. And so um, I, I was expecting something a little more like duct taped together, right? Like uh, just trying to make it work. But I mean, some church plants are like that. I, I imagine, but sure. Seagull yeah. wasn't, yeah. Yeah. And, but yeah, just really impressed. They, you know, they got shirts there with their the name of their church on. If you want to purchase shirts, get, I mean, swag. I think it's kind of cool. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, it was great. More and more coffee and donuts. I so. think yeah, right when you walk in, there's coffee and donuts. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what was the feeling in the room whenever we walked in? I know that at this church we were coming in after the first service, mm -hmm. going into the second <clears throat> service. So there were a lot of people sort of mingling. Yeah. How was the demographic different than the Lutheran church? Definitely uh, skewed more younger, uh -huh. right? Maybe middle age and, and younger. And yeah. there's some energy yeah. in the room, right? Yeah. Uh, definitely. So at the Lutheran church, since we went to the earlier service, it was an older crowd like we've already talked about. But we attended a Lutheran service pretty frequently when we lived back in St. Louis because our kids attended a Lutheran school. Families sit together. Kids are with one another. Oh, yeah. Pretty similar to in a Latter-day Saint context. But when we walked into Sego, there were signage right away that was directing to that's drop right. your kids off this way and go to the worship service that way. Yeah. So that's pretty unique. And not that kids aren't allowed in the service, mm -hmm. but if, you're, if your kids are wanting to be with the kids. Yeah, that would, it would be a different experience. And I hope to go back, you know, here and there uh, to some of these churches. And to, But to go with my family, I'd love for my kids to experience this. And, and it would be an interesting feeling. Like the minute you get there, the kids have a place to go and, you know, the adults can maybe be more present. Yeah, you know? be a little yeah. bit more focused. And yeah, like she's saying, kids are totally welcome in the main services, but they do have that opportunity where they have age-specific groups, probably similar to primary. Yeah. It's, it's probably what's going on there. They're singing songs and having Bible lessons and things of that nature. Um, I eat donuts and coffee there too. <laughs> yeah, And that's when we start the kids on donuts and coffee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How is the music different at the church plant as opposed to the Lutheran church? Yeah, like one thing I want to mention, like all three experiences, they had a live band. Like yeah. even in the Lutheran, yeah. you know, even with these maybe older, more traditional hymns, it was still a live band mm -hmm. that was doing it. I, as a Latter-day Saint, as someone who's been a bishop, I sort of felt this tinge of anxiety because like sometimes it's, we're lucky to have an organ player or we're lucky to even have a pianist up there who can, who can punch out the, the hymns. Yeah. And so I'm thinking, man, if I had to find a whole band, like, I don't know what I'd do. Now, would, there, would a whole band be allowed? Um, no, not, not generally. We're okay. softening on as far as instruments. Before, it was like taboo to have like a guitar played in the, in the sacrament service. But now that's, uh, that's been softened a little bit. But, um, but it, it, yeah, never a band. With, I mean, drums, I think, are still out. Like, don't bring drums in, right? <laughs> so, yeah, the music at the at Seago was, was great. I mean... As far on the level, I'm just like, wow, like, the, we're, we're just like, who's in our neighborhood who can play, you know, because we're in these small geographic wards, and you got some professional talent up there that can really... And put it together. most of them are volunteer. Mm -hmm. In larger churches, they pay worship leaders, but in smaller churches like that, they're either mm -hmm. part-time or it's fully volunteer. So yeah. I led worship for over 15 years at the church back in St. Louis. And I never was paid to do that. That was something I did every single week for 15 years. So it just depends on the size yeah. of the church and all that. But um, that the music is definitely important for our services. Yes. Yeah. Just that feel like you take, I don't know, 20 minutes, would you say, of worship? At yeah. Seagull, there's probably 20, front, 25 minutes. Yeah. 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 I, I so much appreciate just like, again, like usually in my setting as a, as a dad with young kids, I'm just like, I, I'm, I'm frustrated as I sit down at church. I'm like, ah. Yeah. Like I got my kids to church, but I kind of hate my family now. <laughs> yeah. Um, By the way, we do experience that. Oh, yeah, I've met you. But, yeah. And that's I why know. I appreciate it. <laughs> I appreciate just sort of that time to sort of unwind and just get really, really present to that meeting by through the worship music. Mm -hmm. Then they've got the, the words, you know, on the screens, and, and you can just really be present. By the time someone stands up to begin a sermon, you're like, I'm ready to receive that. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm ready to go. And yeah, it I definitely felt. helps set the tone yeah. and the stage for mm -hmm. the spirit and all yeah. that. And I yeah. think we attempt to do that like with our opening hymn, but you know, that can be three, four minutes and then we're moving on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the flow of the service definitely was unique in this. It was more simple, right? So we yeah. came in, sang a bunch of worship songs, and then there was a, a break where we were kind of um, greeting one another. And then there were some announcements 
And then the pastor didn't speak that morning, but an individual from the congregation who actually was a pastor for over 20 years. Pastor Jeff. Pastor, pastor Jeff. Jeff. Another Pastor Jeff. No joke. We're everywhere. No joke. <laughs> yeah. He's a great guy too. Super great guy. Um, <laughs> No, he really is. Yeah. But we had a, a sermon from somebody who doesn't necessarily preach every week, yeah. which is actually the situation I'm in, I'm in right now because I'm preaching at different churches across the valley. So you don't have to just have the main pastor right. preaching all the time. And you could tell his, he was obviously experienced at, at yeah. preaching. He was very good. Yeah. So after we left Sego Church, we went back across the valley to Sandy, Utah, and went to The Well. Now, this is a church that just a few years ago was only, I think, a few hundred people, but they have just exploded in growth, and I think now they're over 2,000. They have four services, I think, on a Sunday, and I was even explaining to you as we were driving there that they meet in a strip mall in Sandy, and they're just kind of gobbling up more and more of the strip mall as they continue to grow, which I'm sure gave you some interesting, yeah. maybe, ideas about what it was going to be like, but we pulled up. And here we are at the well. This was its own thing. Yes. So you, when you said strip by, I thought, okay, there'll be a Mexican restaurant, a Thai restaurant, and then in the middle, there's a, a nice door and, and a pastor's In the Midwest, in the Bible Belt, there are a lot of churches yeah, I'm like sure that. Yeah. Right? But this is, I mean, I walked in there, and the energy, I felt like I was discovering, like, an underground society in, in Sandy, Utah. I'm like, you guys have been here the whole time? Like, it was... The energy of it, uh, it's so much going on. Again, coffee, donuts. And then you walk into the worship center, the sanctuary, where the worship was going on. What was it like sort of walking into that experience? Yeah, again, this went from a party to a concert, right? <laughs> I mean, incredible. Hearing the guy sing on stage, I'm like, this guy from Nashville? Like, what? how do we how do you get this talent here? It was like, wow, a celebration Intense. of God yeah. is happening here. Yeah. And this is cool to witness. Yeah. And the worship is super authentic too. People aren't, even though it might've felt like a concert, uh -huh. people weren't just standing there receiving, but right. like people were singing, arms up, praying, like it was a very interactive experience. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about the demographic. Now we've got this like wide range of demographic, you know, yeah. differences here. Great diversity, just all sorts of, of talent and uh -huh. people involved. It was, it was cool to see. Yeah. And this service, similar to Seago, had a more casual flow. Yes. Where it, we walked in, there was a pretty extended worship music set, and then there was a transition time where we were kind of talking and greeting one another. Yeah, and, and again, you could tell uh, the pastor, I think Pastor Jason, right? Yep. Um, not, not Pastor Jeff. Jeff. <laughs> not Pastor Jeff. They're, they do exist. Uh, obviously well-trained and experienced in delivering a great message, uh, you know, all, tied to, the, to the, the, the good word and referencing scripture and just engaging like I didn't yeah. I wasn't bored yeah just, mm -hmm. say that. Yeah. yeah so I want to talk about three things now that are really important to the evangelical worship experience but also have their place in the Latter-day Saint experience and that is communion or sacrament mm -hmm. baptisms and also the talk or the sermon yeah so let's talk about how you experience each of those three things across the board let's start with communion Right. So in the Lutheran church, it was, you, you sort of gave me a heads up that typically here, if you're not a, a Lutheran. Yeah. If, if, you, you, if you've not been baptized as a Lutheran. Baptized as a Lutheran, then you, you don't participate, uh, which is fine with me. And they actually, it was something you went up to the front. They did, they kneeled at some type of long altar. Uh -huh. And then the pastor came around with the, the emblems. And uh, so easy, easy to do. I think we were really the only ones in the room that kind of sat mm -hmm. back. Yeah. They, they approached us, you know, are you going to partake today? Yeah. No mm -hmm. thanks. And the thing is, is that for us, taking communion of the sacrament has no bearing on like your salvation, mm -hmm. but there's a certain accountability when it comes to communion. At least some denominations see it that way. And we even see Paul talk about this in 1 Corinthians about there being a certain examination of oneself. So I think there are certain denominations that like that accountability to be in place. And at a lot of Lutheran churches, it's called a closed communion, where you have to have been confirmed or baptized as a Lutheran. That doesn't mean that if you go up to take communion, though, they're going to turn you away. Yeah. So it's not like you're doing anything wrong. If you do that. They won't make a scene of it, right? No, right. Nor, do, nor do they look down on you because you're not taking communion with them. Right. It's just how they practice mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Now, that was different, though, than Sego because we also had communion there. Right, and they pass out these cute little all-in-one packets of... <laughs> Have you seen those before? <laughs> no, I've heard of them. Okay, those uh, are like super-duper common in the evangelical yeah. world. But so, you guys do water. Yeah, we do water, yeah. right? And this this was uh, grape juice? Yeah, yeah it was super tart, too. 
at Seago. It's it, actually coffee. It, it made me pucker. <laughs> coffee, <laughs> coffee and a little donut at top. <laughs> <laughs> May as well be. And then at Seago, when they took it, it was just, it was very casual. Yeah. And like they came up and they kind of let like us Like right before it. the sermon, I think. Right yeah. before the sermon. Whereas at the Lutheran church, you could tell it was, it was during a point of the service, it was sort of a fixture. Yeah. It was the latter part of it. Everybody knew the routine of like how to get up, where to go, how to kneel, all that other stuff. Yeah. So again, a lot more structured at the Lutheran church. Mm -hmm. And then at the well, we didn't take communion. Yeah, they didn't even mention it. Right. right. Yeah. And it is not uncommon to go to an evangelical church and not take communion on a mm -hmm. Sunday. Whenever I was pastoring, we'd do it every three to five weeks. Sometimes it'd be every couple weeks, sometimes it'd be every six weeks. But there are definitely plenty of evangelical churches that will do it every single Sunday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is something I just sat and really appreciate about my own faith tradition. I just love, you know, we're so focused on um, an, a tradition of ordinances, you know, spiritual rites, things like that, that it is the pinnacle of not only that meeting, not, not only church, but that day is when we renew our covenants right. with Jesus Christ. And and seeing, I mean, there's so much symbolism, with, even with how the bread and water trays are there with the, the white tablecloth over it, to how the priests are standing and, and breaking the bread, to how they're, they're administering, that they're bringing it to us. And uh, I just, you know, I, I didn't miss that. You know, it really made me love just how we do the sacrament. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So the other thing that's really important to Latter-day Saints, I don't know if you do it on Sunday mornings or if you do it at different times, but baptisms are obviously super important. Yep. And at the well, they announced at the end of service that they were going to be doing a baptism or a couple baptisms in another room. Yeah, and I was intrigued by this. I thought, well, this I'm here. I might as well see yeah. another tradition of baptism. I don't think I've ever seen an infant baptism in another faith or anything. So. Yeah. Well, uh, how, how are baptisms done in your tradition? Yeah. So typically there's uh, the, the, their own independent meeting, usually maybe on a Sunday night, maybe a Saturday. Um, and, you know, love, family, loved ones come to sort of celebrate this moment. And, you know, we have a font sometimes in the Relief Society room or somewhere in, in so the chapel. So it's not in the temple? It's not in the temple. It's in the no, ward? Only baptism for the dead in the temple. And okay. then, yeah, in a, in a chapel, we gather and it's, you know... It's a big font. People are in the font doing the baptism or dressed in white. You know, again, very lots of symbolism mm. in, in those things. So it was even a little bit different, I think, from what, what I've ever experienced. Usually I've seen baptisms done in the middle of service, and that's mm. been done in multiple different ways. But this was interesting even to me because they actually ended the service, and then they had a totally different room that you could walk across the hall to. And they had a set up little like trough almost of water in the middle of this like normal, like the room we're sitting in now. And there was just like a group gathered. So it wasn't everyone from the service. It was whoever probably knew these people and had a connection. Um, what was that like for you to witness and participate in? Yeah, so it was, it was clear two people were not getting in that together. You know, so the pastor just was outside of it as he... He performed the baptism and but I just appreciated you could see in the eyes of those getting baptized I mean there's a story there like yeah this is a moment for them and and it was I, I just you know leaned into that celebration with them I really appreciated um, and again this is a more Protestant thing of of in the moment praying over somebody and it was such it's such a sweet moment to see everybody lean in and you know hands out and as they pray over this person who's taken this incredible step in their in their spiritual journey and really cool yeah yeah so. there were also a lot of cell phones i noticed people yeah. filming would that be done um it seems like we've uh loosened that a little bit since covid since okay. we were zooming mm. uh, i think we still zoom baptisms depending on your stake or area but uh before that was pretty clear no photograph or no pictures during the actual ordinance do your do the people that are getting baptized do they share a story because i don't think that they specifically shared a story at this baptism that right. we saw but i have been to services where before the person is baptized especially probably if it's a smaller church when you're at a mega church they're kind of like doing it quick but at a smaller church a lot of times people have the opportunity to kind of give a testimony almost mm -hmm. of what this means to them mm -hmm. why they're doing it yeah, usually, I mean, every once in a while you'll hear that testimony from the individual getting baptized, but usually it's it's others, either maybe the missionaries that were involved in teaching this person who's getting baptized. Obviously, with that eight-year-old, when I baptized my son, it's his grandma's given a, a talk about okay. baptism. It's very doctrinal focused, right? Of course, we're we're celebrating the person in, in various comments and things, but uh, and they're sort of the focal point in this 
ordinance that reflects the, the death and resurrection of, of their Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, but, uh, yeah, m- more focused on doctrine and principles of the gospel. Yeah. So. Yeah, and like Joy, I've never been to a Latter-day Saint baptism before. Um, I've been invited to plenty, and I'm sure I'll go to one soon. So I don't know if it's like this or not, but that celebratory atmosphere, that's pretty common. I don't know mm-hmm. if I've ever been to a baptism where it's not incredibly right. celebratory. People clapping and right. cheering. Yeah, breaking out in applause yeah. as they come up out of water. That, yeah. that would never happen. I mean, if it did, it'd be like, what is happening here? We got to <laughs> redo this or something. Yeah. And that's just tied to like this belief that like the angels in heaven are rejoicing when just one comes yeah. to the Father, right? So that's that's kind of our our heart posture whenever we see somebody yeah. being And again, with, I mean, we're focused on a lot of the details of, like during the, the sacrament. If the prayer of the sacrament is not said exactly, or there's a misstep that the priest will start over the, or the bishop will signal mm. to the priest to do it again. In a baptism, even if a, a toe comes up out of the water, mm. uh, we will do it again. Yeah. The hair, you know, the girls with long hair will really make sure their hair is pulled back because if that hair comes up or doesn't go down, mm. then we'll do it again. And there's two, there's two witnesses there that are to making sure. sure that's done. So yeah, again, it's sort of on this uh, very ordinance focus level, which I, I really appreciate about our tradition. But again, there's this there's this overtone in, in all of our meetings of reverence, right? Yeah, of, mm. of course. Quiet, right? Mm. Which I really appreciate a lot of the time, but other times I, I sort of want to walk into church and feel like I'm at a party. You know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> sure. So. so the last thing that I wanted to talk about are the different sermons, okay? Mm-hmm. So I know in a Latter-day Saint context on a Sunday morning, most of the time people from the ward come up and they'll give a talk on a certain topic and your teaching time is going to be more tied to Relief Society, Elders Quorum, Sunday School, um, as opposed to in our context, the pastor spends hours and hours and hours a week preparing a teaching from the scriptures. And we heard three very different sermons. Um, at least they seem different to me. So I'm curious to know, based on the teachings we got, how did you experience the three different sermons that we heard? Yeah, so the first one, the Lutheran pastor um, that this one, it felt like a sacramenty talk that I've experienced. I mean, obviously he had experience, he knew his Bible well, um, but just the nature of the atmosphere made it a little more low key, right? Mm-hmm. I'm going to talk with you, share some scriptures, encouragement. Um, and he it, shared a few personal stories. Yeah, yeah. personal stories. So very similar to maybe what uh, Latter-day Saint would experience. Um, at Sego, a guest pastor, I guess, or guest sermon, mm-hmm. um, Good energy. You could tell he'd done it before. He talked about finances, mm-hmm. uh, which you know tied it into biblical teachings and things. But uh, uh, but a little like it was a little this step, few steps up in, in energy, and then in the well. I mean, Pastor Jason, he was next level. He was, he was bringing it. He was bringing it. Right? Uh, and it's uh, you know you got people in the crowd like mm-hmm, amen, yeah. amen, right? And yeah. which uh, that would be out of the ordinary, but. Yeah. Happened in a Latter-day Saint church. And so, uh, you should yeah. try it sometime. I know. I know, I know right? You should start that. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Like, that's oh, the word. Brother Frank. I'm like, <laughs> but uh, but th- again, that's why it was so engaging and entertaining, right? He, and he even had some visual aids up there. He had some Lincoln logs and uh, Jenga, big Jenga set. Yeah. And again, he tied it into his message, which, uh, you know, you can actually watch it. The one we saw yeah. on YouTube. Yeah, we'll link it uh, in the description. Yeah, it was really, it'd be well, well worth it. So, and I love, this is one of my holy envies with Protestants is that, that sermon tradition because... We get it, but it's only every six months. I mean, because yeah. we have inexperienced people. And, and it, I love just the nature of giving people in the congregation a chance to stand, mm-hmm. testify, articulate a gospel principle week after week. Um, you know, and, you know, we have unlimited jokes about how sometimes it can be boring and, and hard to keep up with. But I appreciate that we're involving uh, those there and in the ward to participate. Um, but then at general conference, that's where we hear sermons, right? Yeah. And so when we think of, we may not use the term sermon a lot, but we use a, a you know, general conference talk. That's a sermon. Somebody mm-hmm. who's put hours into preparation mm-hmm. and, and declaring doctrine at times, even, you know, from those that we consider prophets, seers, and revelators that, yeah, uh, this is a sermon, right? And so yeah. we get every six months. You guys experience that really every week. Yeah, and I will say even my experience at General Conference, because I went to two sessions uh, about a year and a half ago, when it comes to how I would define a sermon is you're taking a passage of Scripture, Mm -hmm. you're reading it, you're understanding the context, you're understanding the meaning behind it, and then you're applying it to our context and how we live. I'll say at General Conference, there were a lot of really good talks, but of all the talks I heard, there were only a couple that I would define as a sermon and that they actually 
started from a scriptural passage and then kind of taught from that. In fact, one, the one that I heard that was the most sermon-esque was, I thought, really powerful. But that's probably because I'm yeah. used to receiving teaching that way, which I would imagine in a certain sense, there was something that probably felt um, almost more, it was maybe easier to receive the sermon at the Lutheran church, being that it felt so familiar. It was, yeah. it was more um, in line with even the tone and the cadence and the rhythm that you're used to. Whereas it, I would imagine probably felt just very unique and different hearing specifically Pastor Jason, who was just, I mean, it was like sermon, stand-up co comedian, uh -huh. motivational speech, um, like pep rally. Yeah. Like it was all of those things in one. Yes. Which yeah. is not what we typically get at General Conference. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And there's this uh, emphasis on taking something scriptural and then like unpacking it in yeah. front of everybody. And I think this goes maybe back to the roots of like Sola Scriptura where we don't necessarily have that. And so ours is, we don't take a passage of scripture, we're taking a doctrine. Yes. And that may involve a passage of scriptures, but it may involve these three quotes. <laughs> yes. And you know, this, uh, you know, this general conference talk as well. Yes. Um, and, and so in theory, we're doing the same thing, but it's going to sound, it's going to have a different flavor, right? So oftentimes <clears throat> if you hear a, a pastor preach he has been trained he's gone to like right. schooling and stuff is that for you like a general conference the people that are giving sermons have they been trained somehow is there school for yeah prophets and no. elders and i don't know like traditional training but this a lot of experience yeah. you know by by the time you're at that lectern um, you've given you know some of those men have given you know 30 uh state conference talks they've spoken in hundreds of wards all over the world and so yeah. they're a little more polished that way, but it, it still has a different tone of than what we saw. I mean, they're not pulling out. And here's my Jenga set, you know, like yeah. <laughs> at General Conference, which I appreciate. They're roaming the stage; they don't feel, you know, anchored to the the lectern. Um, and again, that brings some energy. And I and I, you know, it's more of like maybe what we would frame as a fireside. Like when I give firesides, it's going to appear much more like a yes. a, a sermon. Well, and I think not to get too technical here, but there's really two pieces to any sermon mm -hmm. or any talk, and that is the belief. The doctrine, is it being handled properly? And also the communication of yeah. it. Those two things have to go hand in hand. So although a lot of pastors are trained to communicate, we're also trained to handle the scriptures in yeah. a certain way. And what you're bringing up is so incredibly important because it's, it's zeroing in on one of those spaces where evangelicals and Latter-day Saints talk past one another because yeah. mm -hmm. we almost did it just now. Mm -hmm. Because I'm saying, well, a sermon is when you take the scriptures, what has been revealed to us, and you communicate it, right? And you're saying, well, yeah, but we have more that's been revealed to us right. than the scriptures. So we're technically doing the same thing. So to put it for an evangelical audience where a pastor is in an expository sense sort of exegeting the scripture, which is the term that we use, Latter-day Saint speakers, specifically at General Conference, are exegeting doctrine and they're communicating it in a way that's going to be edifying to the hearers. You just yeah. wanted to use that term. <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty... Exegeting. Yeah, I'm pretty excellent at talking just about Just don't exegeting. exegete on us, Jeff. <laughs> okay, so I understand that for Latter-day Saints, it's super important. There's this, this emphasis on how we feel in our services. Um, and maybe they would connect that to the spirit. Mm -hmm. So what did you experience at these three services, whether it's collectively or separately. Yeah. So oftentimes that, that is often one of the kind of the tropes that come our way of like, Oh, Latter-day Saints, they're just too focused on how you feel, not like what's that in the actual book or what Jesus taught. Uh, but sitting, going and experiencing these churches, it's like, hey, you guys bring a lot of feeling into this. Like, yes. because that, again, that worship time, you just like bathe in the love of God, you know, as you read those lyrics or sing along or whatever. So yeah, definitely uh, you, you are a Christ people. I don't know if you're aware of this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, we are. But um, yeah, I mean, so just, and it's so refreshing as a Latter-day Saint who doesn't typically do this to stand with his fellow evangelical brothers and sisters and, and worship God. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, w I would recommend that to everybody, you know, so strong feelings. Um, and again, this isn't, Oh, you know, we, we sometimes we, we try and leverage these feelings. Well, does that mean it's the one true church or we are? Or right. But didn't you feel, didn't you, like, it, sometimes it breaks my heart when I hear Latter-day Saints say, like, it's really sad to go to other faiths' funerals because 
ah, they just don't believe that it keeps going or you know it's, yeah and now like there's there's good feelings here and that's okay and, and yeah because god's there and yeah he's, and people these people are worshiping god and that pleases god well and that's that is a common question that i'll get um when the video i did going to journal conference sacrament meeting fast and testimony people are they're just asking so what did you feel how did you feel there and i think you bring up a really solid point that feelings and emotions are very much a part of i think any religious experience or worship setting but in the american evangelical church yeah we are definitely a very feeling people yeah. and i think that that's good and that's okay now i will say that we did go to churches the latter two in particular that are more on the feeling side or the charismatic side mm -hmm. Um, but there are other denominations that we didn't have a chance to go to, although I don't know what you're doing on Sunday, but we could probably <laughs> go. But there are other churches that are a little bit more thinking. Um, they're a little bit more theological, so you're going to experience it more, and it's going to feel intellectual. like intellectual, or it's almost academic mm -hmm. when you're hearing the sermons and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But that's one of the reasons why I love the Protestant church, like a lot, because the way that I sort of articulate it to people is it's like a stained glass window. You've got all of these different shapes and colors. Some of them might have more jagged edges than others. And yes, they are all distinct or separated by this metal frame. But when you take a step back and you look at it, it makes this beautiful picture of a larger unified expression yeah. of who we are and what we're about. And I think that whole idea of a stained glass window is, I mean, stained glass windows are beautiful. I mean, there's so much light, there's so much shapes, there's so much creativity in it. That's what I love about the Protestant church. And that's what I really appreciate your courage and willingness to kind of step into that and to experience just a, a couple different colors and shapes of that. But it, it also goes to show based on your experience that it's okay for us to experience each other's worship settings and to understand one another, because I have to imagine this gave you additional sort of insight and now you feel that much more informed yeah. about evangelicals and Protestants, if you yeah. will, just experiencing that. Right. Well, it's beautiful that like I can now go worship when I when I need that with my evangelical brothers and sisters and experience that. Mm -hmm. And that's just a beautiful. My like I'm just thinking like with uh, Easter coming up mm -hmm. that you know we have one hour church. I would love to take my kids down the street, go back to the well or, or another church, and because my kids love worship music too, and yeah. for them to be exposed to different churches and see other people worshiping in different ways like that just is going to bless their lives even further and so i learned more than anything like we shouldn't be afraid to walk into each other's churches right um mm -hmm. i think we could do that helped me think like oh if somebody walked in we should probably take a few steps to make sure they know where they're going that they're comfortable they have someone to sit by donuts. if they ask where the coffee and donuts are <laughs> we can clearly explain there's no coffee and donuts uh, and and even to the point of like well, what i do when the tray comes past me you know with the yeah. sacrament or what so um, but that's, it's such a, it just, those walls come down, just going with a trusted friend, trusted friends yeah, and, um, and experiencing that and being like, Oh, I'm okay. Like yeah. I survived and I can go back and, and worship with my evangelical brother and sisters another time as well. Yeah. I think it takes some courage. I mean, I know, I feel like it took some courage for us to step into an LDS ward, to go to the temples, to mm -hmm. traditions that feel just uncomfortable and different. And maybe we don't agree with. Um, certain things here and there. Um, and so I can really appreciate your courage to show up with us and to be present with us and to experience what we're familiar with. And um, that just means something yeah. important. So yeah. yeah, we're better neighbors because of it. Yeah, so 100%. And that's what it's all about. So I think lesson learned here is let's just not be afraid to kind of step out. And wherever you've got connections, wherever you have engagement within your sphere of influence, to reach out to that neighbor, that family member that might be of a different faith persuasion. Maybe if you're in Utah, reach out to your Latter-day Saint neighbor. Or if you're a Latter-day Saint, reach out to your evangelical neighbor. And not only engage in friendship and relationship, but invite one another to your respective worship gatherings. And I think it's, it just does a lot to reinforce a really important aspect of relationship that is in a, a, an area that is so important to all of us. And that is in our faith and our religious expression and in our community. So we really appreciate that you went on this trip with yeah, us. It was fun. It was great. Yeah. And Kurt is an amazing guy. He's an amazing friend. And I love the work that he does on Leading Saints. If you don't know what Leading Saints is, 
It's an amazing podcast where he's providing resources and conversation for people to function optimally within their calling. There's a link in the description. In fact, I was recently featured on it. My wife was recently featured on it. So just go and watch those two if you're going to do anything else. <laughs> but no, really, he has amazing resources. And I don't know if there's any other... He also just recently published a book I called right. Is God Disappointed in Me? Is God Disappointed in Me? Removing Shame from a Gospel of Grace. Mm -hmm. And you guys had an amazing conversation about that whole topic on your podcast. Yeah. You should check it out. We're going to put all the links in the description. Special thanks to Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Sandy, to Seago Church in South Jordan, to The Well in Sandy, to Centerpoint in Orem, Utah, for allowing us to film here. Mm -hmm. This has just been an amazing experience for us to step into each other's context and we hope that it inspires you to do something similar even if it's in the form of watching hello saints videos like this video if you liked it if not like it anyway <laughs> subscribe to the channel support me on patreon if you'd like check out kurt on leading saints and come back for more videos and until next time i'll see you later saints go to church <laughs> <laughs>